Hello everyone and welcome back to True Crime Guru. If you don't already know, this week we are bringing you two episodes. Both of these cases are unrelated, however they both share striking similarities as both of these young men disappeared while simply enjoying a night out. I have called this two episode series Gone with the Night. This episode is part two. If you haven't watched part one yet about the disappearance of Kyle Fleischman, I highly suggest checking it out as Kyle's disappearance is still unsolved. Kyle's episode is conveniently located in the episode description. You do not need to watch part one in order to understand part two though. With that being said, this is part two of Gone with the Night. Tyler Davis's Disappearance. Tyler Davis was born on June 30th, 1989, and would call the Buckeye State his home. Tyler lived in the town of Wilmington, Ohio, which is in between the cities of Cincinnati and Columbus. Therefore, while living in Wilmington, you can still relish the benefits of small town life, while still being conveniently close to bigger metropolitan areas, making it the perfect place to settle down and raise a family. And that is just what Tyler wanted. In 2013, while working at a fast food restaurant, Tyler met a girl named Brittany. Tyler and Brittany did not just jump into a full-on romance, though. They remained good friends for about three years before taking it to the next level. And taking it slow seemed to really work for the couple because they fell madly in love and married in 2017. Even though Tyler lived in Ohio, he was a raging Green Bay Packers fan. So much so that when Tyler and Brittany welcomed their baby boy in 2017, Tyler named him Aaron after the Green Bay quarterback Aaron Rodgers. Tyler finally had the family that he wanted, and Brittany would later say that he was a devout family man and a great provider. As a way to keep their marriage and their bond strong, Tyler and Brittany decided that no matter what, they would set aside three days a year to get out and enjoy quality time together which is something that I think is a really good idea and a lot of couples should implement into their marriage. The three days that were set aside were both of their birthdays and their wedding anniversary. So when it came time for Brittany's birthday on February 24th, 2019, the couple had planned a nice getaway to the Easton Town Center in Columbus. Easton is a very big and very upscale mall that holds about 250 stores and 70 restaurants. It's not too far from where I live and I did visit there once, but that was like several years ago, so I'm sure there's been some changes. But from what I remember, it was pretty cool. Brittany had never been and it was her birthday after all. So they decided it was the perfect place to get away, go out, do some shopping, and even had a couple's massage booked on the 24th. Tyler's parents actually lived right outside of Columbus. So on February 23rd, 2019, Tyler and Brittany had dropped Aaron off to stay with them and then headed over to the Easton. There are two hotels that sit on the town center's property and Tyler and Brittany checked into the Hilton Hotel around 5 p.m. They kind of just hung out and settled in for a bit because they were waiting for Tyler's friend, Sean, to arrive and go out with them. I believe Sean arrived around 8 p.m. and the three of them proceeded to get some dinner and get the night started. They would go to a few bars at the Easton, but most of them closed around midnight, and the trio wasn't quite ready to call it a night. So they decided to take an Uber to a nearby gentleman's club called the Dollhouse. At the Dollhouse, they continued their night of drinking, relaxing, and just having a good time. 
Brittany would later say that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. However, some sources did report that at some point while at the dollhouse, Tyler and Sean had gotten into some sort of argument, either with other patrons or perhaps a bouncer. It wasn't quite clear. Either way, whether they were asked to leave or left voluntarily, the three of them left the dollhouse and took an Uber back to the hotel somewhere around 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, now February 24th. According to Brittany, Tyler had been quite intoxicated by this point and was falling asleep in the Uber back to the hotel. When they arrived and Tyler woke up, she said he seemed kind of confused and was adamant that they were not where they were supposed to be. Now, as someone who has drunkenly fallen asleep on the ride home a time or two, I could totally see waking up and being confused like this, especially if you're in an unfamiliar place. When they exited the Uber, Tyler insisted that he was going to go on a walk and clear his head. Brittany didn't really think that this was a good idea and tried to go after him, but drunk people are going to do what they're going to do sometimes. Also, Brittany really had to use the bathroom and her phone was dying, so Sean told her to just go ahead and that he would follow Tyler and make sure that he was okay. Brittany went back up to the room for about 20 minutes before she decided to go back down and see what was going on. She ran into Sean, who told her that Tyler was just taking a walk, blowing off some steam, and would be right back. Except he didn't come right back. Brittany called him at 3.37 a.m. with no answer. But he did call her right back and again assured her that he was just walking and would be back shortly. It would be about another half an hour before he called again at 4.10 a.m. This time he told Brittany that he was in the woods and that he could see the hotel and would be there in a minute. Now there's been a bit of contingency about Tyler saying he was in the woods. Some have claimed that there are no wooded areas near the mall. However, it is pretty clear on a map that there are some patches of woods close by but none of them are necessarily close to the Hilton, nor are they close to the Courtyard by Marriott, which is the other hotel on the property. However, in an interview with Dateline, Brittany said, quote, he is not an outdoorsy person at all. There could be two trees right beside each other and he would call that woods, end quote. If you combine that with the fact that he was a little intoxicated, we may not want to read into this in the woods claim too much. Brittany would receive another call from Tyler a few minutes later, but this time there was no sound on the other end and after a few seconds, the line disconnected. She would attempt to call him after that, but all the calls went straight to voicemail, meaning that the phone had either died or been shut off. At this point, Brittany was freaking out. Like most of us, she had never been in this situation before, so she started frantically making phone calls to friends and family, asking what she should do. They all tried to assure her to not get too worked up and that Tyler would probably be back after he had sobered up and cooled down. Of course, this did nothing to ease Brittany's worry. She was concerned that Tyler may have been picked up by a police officer for public intoxication or had been in some accident. So she called all the local police stations and hospitals to no avail. At this point, Sean actually leaves her in this panicky state and goes home. By 8 a.m. and Tyler had not returned, Brittany had called a friend of hers that lived in Columbus to help her search for Tyler. They theorized that maybe he had passed out on a bench or somewhere, which would be concerning considering that it was February in Ohio. I actually looked up the historical temperature for Columbus on February 23rd, 2019, and the high that day was 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius, and the low was 33 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Celsius. So not too terribly cold, above freezing, 
but cold enough to be concerned about someone being out in the elements for too long. But they did not find Tyler or any of his belongings. Brittany knew that she had to do the one thing she was dreading. She had to call the police and Tyler's parents to report him missing. Brittany called 911 around 1030, but the Columbus Police Department did not respond until about 1230. They took the report, but they told Brittany that there was nothing that they could do for 72 hours which seems like a crazy amount of time to have to catch up on in a potential investigation. Tyler's loved ones knew that they were on their own and his dad quickly came to the Easton Town Center to search. Brittany had been up all night and hadn't got any sleep. So Tyler's dad instructed her to go care for Aaron and get some sleep while he searched for Tyler. She obliged, but she found herself being too sickened with worry to sleep and decided to get some friends together and go back to the mall to search for Tyler later that night. You can really get the sense that Brittany was very dedicated and determined to find her husband. She managed to get with the manager of the mall and obtain some security footage. The footage shows a man matching Tyler's description walking away from the Hilton Hotel at 4.15 a.m. However, Brittany and many others believe that this could also be Sean in the footage, as it is very faint and the two men have very similar stature. The Columbus PD did not conduct their first official search until two days later on February 26. They did, however, conduct a pretty extensive search. They theorized that Tyler may have fallen in and drowned in some of the nearby ponds, so they used sonar to search them, but unfortunately came up empty. They were also able to obtain more security footage. This footage showed Tyler walking through the Abbott Laboratories and Huntington Bank complexes. I found this location to be interesting considering that Tyler said he was in the woods and thought he saw the hotel. These are larger office buildings with lots of trees surrounding them, so I think it could very well be where Tyler was when he said this. The office park is a mile and a half or 2,414 meters from the Hilton, and that is a considerably far walk that late at night and in cold temperatures. Although I also mentioned this in part one with Kyle Fleischman's disappearance, the cold may not bother you as much if you have been drinking. When the police obtained Tyler's phone records, all of the calls that Brittany explained were corroborated, and they also found something else interesting. Tyler had used voice command to ask his Google Maps for directions back to the hotel. I do have some audio of this, and I do apologize as it is very faint. Columbus Police Detective Jason Bramer has poured over the images. Davis going off on his own after a night out with his wife and friend. Listen to this cell phone audio. He wanted to come home. He wanted to get back to his hotel. I'm honestly not sure what to make of this besides that Tyler was clearly lost and still somewhat intoxicated. We also know that his phone either died or was shut off shortly after which just leaves the question of where Tyler went after making this search. There have been at least six other major searches for Tyler since, and no sign of him has emerged. It really seems like he just vanished into thin air. Two years later, Brittany petitioned the court to have Tyler declared legally deceased. And on December 15th, 2021, a Clinton County, Ohio judge granted this request, which I was honestly really surprised to see as this process is usually much more complicated and can take years. According to the Wilmington News Journal, in Ohio, it usually takes at least five years to have a missing person declared legally deceased. However, they wrote, quote, when the person who has disappeared and has been continuously absent from the person's last place of domicile without being heard from and been exposed to a specific peril of death 
even if the person has disappeared for less than a five-year period, end quote. Some of that might not make sense to you because, quite frankly, some of it did not make sense to me either. But I think the gist of it is, if there is reasonable belief that a person who has disappeared has died, then they can be declared legally deceased. Despite this declaration, the Columbus PD continues to work Tyler's case as a missing person's case and are working hard to bring him home. And Brittany still holds out hope that he will come home as well. With this case being as bizarre as it is, there are obviously more theories than there are facts. Because of this, there has been a circus of online speculation that has gotten extremely out of hand, in my opinion. The main focus of these online armchair detectives has been on Brittany, which on a surface level isn't too crazy considering that she is the spouse and statistically would be the main person of interest in terms of foul play. A lot of people have questioned her story in saying that it doesn't line up. However, I'm not exactly sure where the basis is of this claim, considering that Brittany's story has been corroborated with phone records and surveillance footage. Personally, nothing about her story feels off to me. Having been around intoxicated people and been intoxicated myself, Everything Brittany said regarding Tyler doesn't feel like atypical behavior for a drunk person. Her behavior has been called into question as well. She did an interview with the popular podcast True Crime Garage, and for whatever reason, this interview has been picked apart and picked apart again by people online. The main thing I saw was people said she sounded rehearsed. But Brittany has done a lot of interviews, and I don't think it's unreasonable to think that once a person tells a story so many times, it might sound rehearsed. And doing all of these interviews only makes Brittany look less guilty in my mind. In cases that I've seen where the spouse is acting suspicious, they do not do media interviews and they do not help out with searches. And if they do interviews, they usually make the whole thing about them and sound pretty narcissistic. But that is not the case with Brittany. As far as I can tell, she is still advocating for Tyler just as hard as she was from day one. Just so you guys understand the extent of this toxic online speculation, let me tell you some of the things that Brittany has been forced to endure. One of these so-called detectives dug up a speeding ticket that Brittany received when she was like 16, which of course has absolutely no relevance to the case at all. Another posted a picture of the car that Brittany's father tragically died in while she was still young, using this to say that Brittany's mother killed her father and staged the accident, and now Brittany is following in her footsteps. Absolutely absurd. There is absolutely no basis to any of these claims, and I find it very distasteful to bring up yet another one of this young woman's tragedies and then try to use it to poorly explain her guilt. On top of this, Brittany has had to endure hateful and mean comments about her weight, her appearance, and some have even called Aaron's paternity into question. All of it baseless, of course. One of the instigators for this kind of content was originally on the Facebook page that Brittany set up for Tyler called Bring Tyler Davis Home. This person was removed for a certain commentary and then took it upon themselves to start their own Facebook page dedicated to Tyler, allowing this kind of conspiratorial commentary. The creator of this spinoff page did eventually make a pretty long post apologizing and proclaiming Britney's innocence, but the damage was done by that point, so I will let you guys decide for yourselves the level of sincerity that holds. The second person of the public's interest would be Sean. Now, in my opinion, this holds a little more water than Brittany, 
because some of Sean's actions do seem a little abnormal. For starters, why did he go home when Tyler was first missing and Brittany was panicking trying to find him? Tyler was supposedly his friend, so you think there would be at least some level of concern for him. I also did not see Sean mentioned anywhere as being part of any of the searches for Tyler. Now that does not mean that he did not participate. It just means I did not see him mentioned anywhere. Let's say for a minute that perhaps Sean was involved in Tyler's disappearance. A lot of people have said that he harmed Tyler during the time frame when they first got back to the hotel and Brittany went to the room and Sean went after Tyler. I don't know why though, because the phone calls that were verified by records took place after this interaction and after Sean was back with Brittany. So when exactly did Sean have the opportunity to kill Tyler and then dispose of his body in such a way that he still hasn't been found today? It just doesn't seem to add up to me. Of course, none of this reasoning stopped online harassment towards Sean either, which is the reason I chose not to disclose his last name in this video. After that episode of True Crime Garage aired, web sleuths managed to find Sean's name, address, and phone number and harass him, which is behavior I do not condone whatsoever. As usual, the possibility of Tyler wanting to leave on his own and start a new life has been brought up as well. However, there just isn't any evidence to support this. A Columbus police detective said in reference to Tyler searching for directions, quote, this showed me Tyler wasn't trying to sneak off and have a life somewhere else. He wanted to come home. He wanted to get back to his hotel room, end quote. An accident is of course another possibility. Tyler was intoxicated, so it could be possible that he passed out somewhere and succumbed to the elements or even possibly choked on his own vomit, which does happen sometimes. But with this, his body would have likely been found by now. And as far as I know, there is no animal activity in the area that would have concealed his body in such a way that he would not have been found. The same could be said about suicide. It is often said that it's difficult to commit suicide and hide your own body especially when it would be impulsive, which would be the case for Tyler. Regardless, detectives are still working on Tyler's case actively, and Brittany and the rest of Tyler's loved ones are still working to bring him home. It is unfortunate that online speculation and theories have hindered the investigation in some ways. Which brings me to say this, and I have said this before, these cases are not just stories. They are real people with real families that have real feelings just like you and me. I urge everyone to please be careful about what you're saying about these cases. I, of course, welcome and encourage commentary, but I would never condone commentary that is just downright incorrect, hateful, or not pertinent to the case. I think Brittany summed it up pretty well in an interview with Columbus Monthly. Quote, We've all seen how damaging social media is. There's going to be a point, maybe 15 years down the road, when our son gets online and finds this. He's going to see people talking so badly about his dad and me, and it's just so awful. And I don't think people are considering the gravity of what they're saying and how it can really affect people. End quote. This episode concludes the two-part series, Gone with the Night, and I hope everyone shares both Kyle Fleischman's and Tyler Davis's stories so that we can help bring them home. Unfortunately, I probably will be adding to this series later because disappearances of this nature are all too common. At the time of his disappearance, Tyler Davis was 29 years old white with brown hair and brown eyes. He stood five feet, 10 inches tall and weighed about 170 pounds. Tyler also has a very distinctive red birthmark that continues up his neck, chest, and right hand. 
He was last seen wearing a blue and green flannel shirt, jeans, and black and white Nike shoes. If you have any information about the disappearance of Tyler Davis, please call the Columbus Police Department at 614-645-4624. Thank you everyone for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed both parts of this series. And if you haven't watched part one yet, it is conveniently located in the episode description. I also ask that you please subscribe so that way you can stay up to date on all content. Also, please follow the channel on all social media platforms. If you have a case in mind for the channel, please email your suggestion to truecrimeguru channel at gmail.com and I will review.